July 1st saw President Lyndon B. Johnson attending a Democratic Governor's Conference at St. Louis, Missouri. In an effort to help all 50 governors plan, budget, and coordinate state administration to an extent heretofore unknown, the President announced that soon each of them will have the opportunity to directly review, advise, and consult on every federal program affecting his state. President Johnson also warned governors of the need to direct more efforts to the improvement of life for all Americans. He reminded them that the ultimate goal of every state and federal program must be to bring a new quality into the society. A troubled month would see the urgency of America's social problems and the president's words dramatically and painfully brought home. Following one of the most intensely active months in United States diplomacy, President Johnson finally had a chance to get acquainted with his new grandson, Lynn. The president and his now enlarged family spent a few quiet days together in the relative privacy of the LBJ ranch. July 4th was a day of particular pleasure for the first family, the baptism of Patrick Lyndon Nugent. Though his grandfather might daily command the attention of the world and its leaders, young Lin showed promise as a commanding figure himself. His mere presence proved that even a president might occasionally find himself only another onlooker. During his vacation, the president signed into law some 20 acts of Congress issued a continuing flow of executive orders and proclamations, and received and read dozens of reports touching on all governmental activities and the ever new problems confronting the nation. He was frequently briefed on major and lesser developments around the world and held interviews with members of the foreign and domestic news media. Still, it was a time for a man to relax with his family and friends, a time to enjoy them and the lands his efforts have won. On July 11th, the demonstration in front of the White House for once was being held in the name of fun and fellowship. The Nobles of Fundum held the 93rd Annual Shrine Parade. Though gaiety was the parade's atmosphere, shrine activities support many important philanthropies. Chief among them are 17 hospitals for crippled children and three institutes for research and treatment of children suffering severe burns. Former German Chancellor Ludwig Erhard, visiting America on a lecture tour, met with President Johnson on July 11th. The two men hold a special friendship, a simple liking for one another. Dr. Erhard is known to the world as the architect of the German economic recovery following World War II. The former and present leaders discuss their country's mutual problems, ranging from American troop levels in Europe to the constant search for a meaningful world peace. On July 12th, Chief Petty Officer Stuart Baltimore of the White House staff received the distinction of having his retirement papers personally signed by the President of the United States. Mid-July brought the White House a series of meetings delving deeply into the nation's social and economic problems. However, the most recent of many periodic inspection trips to South Vietnam by the Defense Secretary was the singular obsession of the news media. Lost was the simple fact that it is his duty to oversee general conduct of the war and resolve its constant swirl of diverse problems. A limited troop increase to meet requests from field commanders was headlined across the nation. 
positive progress received scant notice. 28 months of Allied troop buildup, which saved from extinction South Vietnam and some 15,000 Americans sent there by two previous administrations, were gradually turning the tide of war in favor of the South. Prior to 1965, the war was costing Hanoi virtually nothing. Now, Hanoi must send 13,000 troop replacements south each month. Now, Hanoi must import annually over 2 million tons of supplies to sustain war. Now, Hanoi must constantly engage half a million workers in the repair of bomb damage. In the south, the growing impact of free elections and social, economic, and land reform is welding the people into a new nation. American willingness to keep a promise and the natural right of South Vietnam to self-determination have been the mainstay of administration policy. Underlying President Johnson's resolve to meet the nation's obligations in the face of a small but vicious home opposition is his conviction that all people and nations have inherent right to control their own destiny. He is a great sailor. Completing 43 years on duty for the nation, Chief of Naval Operations Admiral David L. MacDonald received a final honor on July 13th. President Johnson awarded him a gold star in lieu of the Second Distinguished Service Medal and offered the country's appreciation and respect for service as one of the many fine commanders who has kept America and the world secure from many forms of aggression. President Johnson spoke of the unnoticed but historic roles, particularly in South Vietnam, of the United States Navy on duties for peace. War is not the only business of the United States Navy. Peace and the guarding of peace is a constant and a primary duty of all of those who serve beneath our flag. In remote hamlets, the teams of Seabees are building a free nation as part of the pacification effort. Throughout South Vietnam, more than 2,000 Navy doctors and dentists and corpsmen help the Marine units in this vital other war. They were convinced that here among the people, the elusive prize of peace will someday be found. A 21-year record was set by the President's 1967 savings bond sales campaign. On July 19th, while honoring 15 agencies achieving over 90% participation, President Johnson announced that almost 80% of all government employees purchased bonds this year. And in the nation's first quarter, members of the armed forces bought $90 million worth of bonds. This is a very strong evidence, I think, of our determination to meet our responsibilities here at home and to deliver on our commitments in other places in the world. I think that should be the spirit of our savings bond program. That should be the spirit that spread across our country. Just because we don't call this World War I or we don't call this World War II, we still have responsibilities, we still have obligations, we still have great needs. And we are calling upon our people and the federal employees ought to set the example for the rest of the country. Hostess for almost 2,000 Washington area youngsters on July 19th, the First Lady attended a special performance of King Arthur. It opened a summer series of plays designed especially for children. Throughout the season, area social and welfare agencies will distribute free tickets to young people who might not otherwise have the chance to see a live stage production. Though Mrs. Johnson urged her eager guests to learn that the play is the thing, they could not miss the opportunity to get better acquainted with their charming fellow theater goer.
President Johnson has posed for his administration and humanity the question, what better thing can government do than to make people live better and longer? In nearby Maryland is one effort of the American government, the National Institutes of Health Basic Research Programs. On July 21st, the president visited the medical men and technicians whose creative explorations are making the institutes a billion dollar success story, this NIH. And this is where I like to come once a year and more often as possible to learn what they're doing in order to try to help them more. President Johnson saw and learned of the latest progress toward prevention and cure in the major fields of hypertension, heart disease, and cancer. The National Institutes of Health invest annually about one and a half billion dollars in over 17,000 research programs. Discoveries in the Institute's 80-year history have saved the lives and health of millions of Americans. The Gospel of St. John tells of a place where the lame and the halt and the blind went to be cured. And that ancient place was called Bethesda. And 2,000 years later, this place called Bethesda also is the place where the sick and the injured can have some hope. Administration handling of the June Arab-Israeli war crisis had been acclaimed by critics and friends, both at home and abroad, as one of the finest hours in United States diplomatic history. On July 24th, Ambassador to Israel Walworth Barber and a special Mideast advisory group reported on the progress of peace in that troubled part of the world. Mutual acceptance of one another by the countries of the area was emerging. Ancient antagonisms were being replaced by recognition of the need to work together for their common good. A historic breakthrough for lasting peace in the Middle East was becoming a distinct possibility. Unanticipated expenditures and lower revenues threatened a record high deficit in the government's budget. Weeks of meetings examined the paradox of unprecedented prosperity and the compelling pressures for a tax increase. Overwhelming facts remain. Commitments abroad and essential programs at home could not be abandoned. Historically, increased taxation is never popular. A test of political integrity, seldom seen on the eve of an election year, would soon face President Johnson. July was bringing America a wave of urban riots never before seen. The desperate cry of the poor of all races was demanding the nation's attention. No thoughtful person could deny that the immediate need for improved housing, health, education, employment opportunity, and hope for the future must receive affluent America's highest priority. The ghetto explosions gave new emphasis to administration efforts to expand its programs to meet those needs. The harsh reality was thrust on the Congress and the majority of the people of the extreme necessity to better the life of America's poor. No one believed that centuries-old inequities could be cured instantly. However, new and massive social rebuilding was becoming imperative. Of the 70 major riots to strike America during this troubled summer, the worst of the year and the nation's history would hit Michigan's largest city. Extremists and opportunists were perverting a just cause and protest. Violence and lawlessness became ends in themselves. On July 24th, for the first time in a quarter of a century, a state governor requested federal troops to put down a disorder beyond his control. Within hours, the president responded by sending 4,700 soldiers into the riot area. At midnight, as soldiers restored peace to the streets of America's fifth largest city, President Johnson addressed the nation. Law enforcement is a local matter. It is the responsibility of local officials and the governors of the respective states. The federal government should not intervene except in the most extraordinary circumstances. The fact of the matter, however, is that law and order have broken down in Detroit, Michigan. Pillage, looting, murder, and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. They are criminal conduct. And the federal government, in the circumstances here presented, had no alternative but to respond. 
I know that with few exceptions, the people of Detroit and the people of Newark and the people of Harlem and of all of our American cities, however troubled they may be, deplore and condemn these criminal acts. I know that the vast majority of Negroes and whites are shocked and are outraged by them. Yesterday's neglected problems are testing, as never before, the nation today. For President Johnson, America's youth hold the promise of a better tomorrow. Sponsored by the American Legion, a Boys Nation group met with the President on July 26th. He told them of the hope they carry for the future when he reminded them of the words of one of America's poets. Emerson once said, what is man born for but to be a reformer, a remaker of what man has made, a restorer of truth and good? To be a reformer is to be responsible. It is to be a remaker and not a wrecker of what man has made. It is to be a restorer and not a destroyer of truth and good. Who can we look to to get this job done in the years ahead? You. You and young men like you. The challenge is there waiting for you. A troubled month was closing with the country and the president receiving increasingly harsh reports of widespread urban unrest. Under President Johnson's administration, new efforts to uplift America range from housing standards that would eliminate city tenements to a billion dollar agency to combat poverty. These impressive breakthroughs serve to highlight the fact that even more concerted efforts to raise living and opportunity standards for millions of Americans held in poverty's grip are needed. On July 29th, President Johnson established a special advisory commission on civil disorders to delve deeply into the social soul of the nation. It will be led by Illinois Governor Otto Kerner and New York City Mayor John V. Lindsay. The president reminded the commission, no society can tolerate massive violence any more than a body can tolerate massive disease. But just saying that does not solve the problem. We need to know the answer, I think, to three basic questions about these riots. What happened? Why did it happen? What can be done to prevent it from happening again and again? What we're really asking for is a profile of the riots, of the rioters, of their environment, of their victims, of their causes and effects. July closed on a nation whose social fabric was being tested as never before. Forced on the nation and the majority of people was the fact that many painful months and years lay ahead. The solution of decades-old problems had become a national imperative. And let us build something much more lasting. Faith between man and man. Faith between race and race. Faith in each other and faith in the promise of beautiful America. Let us pray for the day when mercy and truth are met together. Let us pray and let us work for better jobs, better housing, and better education that so many millions of our own fellow Americans need so much. Let us then act in the Congress and in the city halls and in every community so that this great land of ours may truly be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all.